It's time for the Daily Planet Podcast Show. So sit back, relax, and give us a go. Scott and Matt and maybe a guest. Undertaking an epic podcast. We're gonna ramble on about movies and books and television and directors and film festivals and this really long list of stuff that I know nothing about, but they gave it to me and they really wanted me to read through it. And that's all I can really say about it, but it's gonna be great. show. Hello and welcome to the Daily Planet Podcast, your weekly podcast for all things movies, TV, books, and anything else we feel like talking about. My name is Scott Daly, Editor-in-Chief of DailyPlanetFilms.com, and I'm joined as always by my co-host and co-editor, Matt Freeman. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic today, Scott, and I am thrilled to be talking about a great director who we both love, Wes Anderson. Yeah, I'm really excited about this too. Um, We've done, this is our third of these uh, deconstructing series, we're calling them, um, where we break down a director and talk about all his works. And this is the first one that I've watched every single one of his movies in preparation for this. Like, uh, I think Quentin Tarantino, I watched just a few. Um, Christopher Nolan, I didn't really watch any because I don't like him as much. But um, I watched every single one of these movies over again. Yeah. And I am... I forget how much I love Wes Anderson until I'm until I've watched one of his movies and then and then he's my favorite filmmaker for a week or so and then I sort of forget again um but hopefully this discussion will draw out some of the reasons why we like it so much I think so I think so I'm I'm looking forward to it but first Matt we have some movie news to discuss Excellent let's do it and and I hope you like comic book movie news because that's what we got today. I mean, I mean, I don't, but but we we always end up talking about <laughs> these comic book things anyway. So well, it's it's the biggest it's the biggest part of the industry right now. It's um, true. And we're gonna start with Batman v Superman because it's my favorite thing to talk about. Um, so you'll recall we talked about uh, I think a couple weeks ago that there is a three hour rated R cut of this movie that exists and was going to be placed on the DVD and Blu-ray when the movie was released. Rumors right now, and this is unconfirmed, it's just a rumor, is that they're going to re-release this R-rated cut in the theaters. Um, so what, what, do you, what do you feel about this as a person who has not and probably will not see the movie? Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it seems unlikely. I've never heard of this happening before. But that said, if it does happen, I bet it will make money because... Um, you know, it seems to me to be sort of a, it seems to me as someone who doesn't really understand the industry that well, honestly, to be a good financial decision, because you're basically spending an extremely minor incremental amount of money to potentially get a lot of viewers, because there's, there's going to be people who are curious about this. Um, and there's going to be, you know, it, they could potentially, there's, there's a small probability that they're going to hit like a gold mine in the same way that Deadpool did incredibly well, sort of unexpectedly um, being rated R. Maybe people will, will v- sort of view the movie differently when it becomes rated R. I don't know. I don't know anything about, about the likelihood of these things. It is an interesting decision. Um, on one level, it seems like they're just grasping for straws to kind of re- recover some of the the loss that they perceive from uh, the initial run. I don't know. What do you think, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely the case. I think the movie dipped again pretty big last weekend, and it projections are saying it will not hit a billion dollars now, which is like the the golden standard for success in these huge tentpole movies. Um, if they don't hit a billion dollars, it's not seen as a success, which is kind of crazy. Um, but... Um, and there's a there's a car alarm going off, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So I mean, this this could potentially because I think it's going to get close to a billion. So even if this is only moderately successful on re-release, I think it'll push the film beyond that mark. Um, so they'll at least be able to claim it as a success. I think this is going to work because I think there's a lot of people out there. You know, as much as the critics didn't like the movie and the movie didn't really have legs, there's a lot of really passionate fans out there that are going to go see it again to see the true version, the the artist's intended version, which is a rated R version of a, a kid's comic book. But um, yeah, I think it's going to work. Um, I think there's also a lot of holdouts, people that haven't seen it yet that might say, oh, well, this is the intended version. Let me give it a shot. 
Um, yeah. There's no way in hell I will go see this movie, though. I... Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, I will say that when when it eventually comes on DVD or, or some streaming service, I would probably rather... No, I would definitely rather watch the rated R cut than the um, than the theatrical cut if I were forced to choose. Um, just because I don't know, I don't know if I can justify that decision. Actually, well, I, I, guess... I think it's fascinating because <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a lot of a lot of cuts of Batman punching people's faces off or something yeah. equally violent and inappropriate. But I think it's yeah. yeah I think like I, I'm not going to pay to watch it. Um, if it's on, if there's a rated R cut on cable or something, one day I might watch it out of sheer curiosity, but yeah. Oh, it's such a bad movie. <laughs> um, so moving on and this news item is kind of spoilers for Batman versus Superman, but it's been out for three weeks. And if you haven't seen it yet, I'm assuming you haven't. So we said in our, our review of the movie a couple weeks ago that Superman dies at the end of the movie. Um, but of course Superman isn't really dead and we knew it then everybody knew it, but there was a, a, a video taken from the set of justice league because justice league started filming today and it was Zack Snyder introducing everyone to the cast of justice league and Henry Cavill is there. So not only is Superman not dead, but they're not even trying to hide the fact that he will be back in the justice league. Movie. That's funny. They're not even doing a, a, a force Awakens style secrecy campaign. They're just like, I mean, really, everyone everyone did know this because if it doesn't even matter like what version of the comics you're following. If 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 Superman is killed is killed by Doomsday, then Superman is obviously coming back because that was the whole <laughs> that was the whole story in the comic books. It was a whole big thing. So right, but at least I'll give it the comics. For a few years, they allowed Superman to stay dead and had all these other um, stories about people trying to take his place. I think there were four different people vying for the position of Superman after Superman died. One of them was like a robot. I don't know. The comics are weird, but yeah, I just think if if you're going to bring him back immediately, what was the point of even killing him? Like it didn't, I, I don't know. It didn't have a point. Yeah. <laughs> it was because of, cause of the whole Jesus metaphor. Yeah. That's really it. I mean, you have to be, the only way to be dramatic in a story is to kill someone, Scott. That's the only, that's the only conceivable source of drama <laughs> in a story. Just like how Wes Anderson kills all of his characters in oh, every movie. all the time. <laughs> so, um, the next news item I had is also comic book related. Um, the Spider-Man reboot movie, which is now in control of Marvel, and it's going to be a Sony picture still, but um, Marvel is going to produce it. Um, first of all, the movie's titled Spider-Man Homecoming, or at least... Um, temporarily which i find hilarious it's like kind of a throwing it in the face of sony but um the villain of the film is or at least a villain in the film is going to be the vulture and the only reason i bring that up matt is because the vulture is the character that sam raimi wanted to use in the third spider-man film and they told him he wasn't allowed to and that they forced venom down his throat and that's why that movie turned out so disappointing is because he lost control of his own franchise um, so this this also feels to me like a an f u to the former uh franchise owner um at sony um cause, who never thought this character could work in a movie so um that kind of excites me yeah well, that, that that is cool it, it's not sam Raimi who's in charge this time though right no no sam okay. he's no he's gone uh it's i forget i forget who i don't know who's attached to it i mean marvel is is in control of the movie um, so it'll be people at Marvel, um, but it's exciting. And yeah, uh, on unrelated news, uh, the first Civil War screenings happened, um, I think a couple days ago, and it's very positive, especially Spider-Man's depiction. Um, some people are saying a better Spider-Man and better Peter Parker than even um, the Sam Raimi version. So that's kind of hmm. exciting. Yeah, that, that's that's surprising because I had the impression that Spider-Man was an extremely minor part of that. And if it, you'd have to have more than a tiny bit to even make a comparison, I would think. But right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Apparently he's a bigger part of the, the, the film than was let on, um, which is exciting. But, I'm happy. Yeah. 
That's good because he's really the only moral center of the entire Marvel universe, so it's appropriate that he would be in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So last item. This one isn't comic book related, although it might as well be. Um, yeah. The the trailer for Rogue One, a Star Wars story, the first Star Wars spinoff, dropped last week. Um, so we're we're now in the gear up cycle cycle this year for the next Star Wars film. Um, Matt, what did you think about this trailer? I, I was I was excited. My my oh, my impression in retrospect was that I learned something about myself, and that is that I really just want to see another Star Wars movie using exactly the same aesthetic and trappings and sounds as the originals. And I don't actually want anything new or different. <laughs> and, and I'm okay with that um, because that's what this trailer is. It's, it's got, it's got the original AT-ATs and Death Stars and, and costumes and even some of the characters. Um, it does look like it might be going for kind of a different tone or, or, or level of violence. Um, which incidentally is one thing I noticed about the force awakens is that there's so much more violence than the originals actually, but that's a tangent. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually was pretty excited by this despite my cynicism. How about you, Scott? how do you feel? Yeah. I mean, I think when I was first told the, this idea, um, of the movie, which is that this is, this is about the team that originally stole the plans to the first Death Star that were put into R2 and kicked off the entire trilogy. I didn't think it sounded that great. And I didn't think the idea of Star Wars spin-off movies sounded great. But I think this looks really, really good. I think um, it, it has everything I want in like a spin-off and that um, it doesn't seem like they're going to do a lot of Jedi stuff. Hopefully there's not any Skywalkers at all. Like I think Darth Vader's probably going to make like a cameo, but... Um, I, I want it to. I want it to be just a war movie set in the Star Wars universe, and that's what it seems like it's going to be. Um, and it's even got the scale right. Like I love the shot in the in the trailer where the the Rebel Force is charging forward, and there's the big ATATs above them, and like, yeah. like that's just this is great imagery. Like if you can do Saving Private Ryan in space with Star Wars, like that would be amazing. And that kind of looks like what it's going to be. And I, I, I like the cast a lot. Um, I like that Star Wars has gotten real diverse casting now. There's like another uh, female main character. There's um, a couple Asian characters, which you barely ever see any Asians in in Star Wars. So that's really exciting. Um, I, I can't wait. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. I'm almost more excited for this than I am for the con- uh, continuation of the trilogy. To be honest with you, you know, unfortunately, I agree. Um... Yeah, the uh, well, well, we'll talk about Force Awakens in a little bit, I guess. But th- this this actually seems refreshing and not like it's trying to just drag something um, from nothing. Yeah, and like I, the Star Wars galaxy is enormous, and the trilogy have always taken a very small world approach to it. How everyone's related to everyone and. There's like we only go between a few planets, and um, I I want to see a realization of more in the world. I think there's plenty of room in this galaxy for a bunch of different kinds of stories, involving a bunch of different kind of people that can be their own one-off stories that don't have to really tie back. I mean, they're always gonna like tangentially tie back to the main trilogy or whatever, but. Um, just the idea of, of having a one-off movie and it like if this movie does well, are they going to make a, a sequel to rogue one? I, like, I hope not. <laughs> right. Yeah. I kind of hope not too. I, I don't I, want rogue too. I mean, honestly, like what strikes me is that this really reminds me of like some of the star Wars novels that I read when I was in like, like middle school and have completely forgotten about until this conversation. Um, but, but like basically this is what the star wars quote unquote expanded universe went through it, it it was a series of of you know books and comic books where it was just different writers with different ideas all of which loved the star wars universe and were working inside it but they all had their own ideas about stories they wanted to tell and and so you you had a really broad range of of you know um 
of stories happening and characters and and things went off in all kinds of different directions and some parts of it were really good and some parts of it were actually extremely terrible and you know there were some really popular video games that came out of it so it's almost like now that the property has passed over to disney they're they're sort of self-consciously restarting that whole process of um exploring the the star wars um yeah star wars universe i guess yeah um and but they're maybe maybe they're sort of taking the best elements from the expanded universe as it was before they kind of rebooted it and maybe they're just going to do their own new creative thing but I, I see the process as being very similar this time around yeah yeah i agree um i hope like we're gonna get we're gonna get to a point of saturation with these films um i mean we're gonna get a yearly cycle where probably about this time next year is when the first episode eight trailer is gonna drop and the year after that will be the next original spinoff um but we're at a point right now where I'm, I'm still excited and I'm going to enjoy my excitement. And hopefully, like, if the script is good, I think they'll have a hit on their hands. So, we'll yeah. see. We will see. Yeah. All right. Matt, Wes Anderson. Let's talk about this director. Um, before yes. we Before we go through each individual film and, and talk about what we liked and, and even what we didn't in some cases, what is your, your overall... Um, Wes Anderson uh, opinion as as far as how he ranks as a filmmaker and a storyteller. I I just absolutely love all of the movies that I've seen. I think I think one of my to toot my own horn, one of my best tweets that I ever tweeted <laughs> was uh my list of Wes Anderson movies that have failed to make me cry, which was an empty list because all of his movies make me cry. That's the joke. Um <laughs> And it, it, it just on on every level, really. But but one of the main things you notice, and I'm sure we'll go into this. Like the first thing you notice almost is the um, the visual aspect of his films and how just meticulously arranged they are in a visual sense, um, and how every you know every frame is indeed a painting um, in these movies. But but also just the characters, the stories are always extremely original. There's always at least one moment, usually more like three moments, that just absolutely punch you in the gut. And and then on top of that, there's this he he manages to have these very interesting and unique tones in all of his movies that you you don't even know how to de- how to how to take them the first time you see them in many cases. But eventually, they kind of grow to become your favorite things. So that's my nutshell. How about you, Scott? What's your what's your one thousand foot view of Wes Anderson? Yeah, I really agree. I kind of I came to Wes Anderson relatively late in my film watching life. I guess um, I the, I didn't see anything until Life Aquatic, um, and I think it was one of my old roommates that introduced me to that movie, and then. I liked it so much that I went back and saw uh, Tenenbaum's Rushmore, eventually Bottle Rocket. Um, but I, I've I, I've truly loved every single one of his films, um, and I think you know, th- I think you're right that I think these are infinitely rewatchable. Um, you find something new every time you watch it. Just just not only in the story, but in the details of the production, like you were saying that it's so detailed, it's so personal. Um, everything like he he's he's kind of a a director that is very closely involved in every aspect of the production. Um, and I notice that a lot. Like I have all these movies, the criterion collection, um, except for grand Budapest. Um, and I, so I, I listened to and watched a lot of interviews and documentaries in between my rewatches and like, he's involved in everything. Um, he's, I mean, and all directors are to a certain extent, but I think Wes Anderson has the music in mind as he's filming um, he's intimately involved in the set decoration and design. A lot of the stuff is is hand painted, like uh, in the the Royal Tenenbaums. Like the the house was built, like they they rented this, uh, rented or bought this this house and like built it, built the inside to be his vision. Um, the Darjeeling Limited, like they bought a train and literally hand painted a train on the outside. Like I couldn't believe that. <laughs> um, yeah, and. Uh, yeah, it's just 
his characters, the story, everything just comes together into these these like wonderfully weird but like delightful experiences. Every single one of them. And you're right, actually, absolutely gut punching, um, and and funny at the same time. Yeah, and at, we we'll probably go through this as we go through each of the movies individually. But I think most of these movies, the first time I saw them, I was probably really confused. Um, I, especially when I was younger. Um, maybe I should hold this until we get to Rushmore since that was the first one I saw. But when I first saw Rushmore, I was just confused because, because you're, you're not, this is very atypical style of making movies and it focuses on very, very unusual aspects of life. Um, and, and you're just not sure what it's trying to do. And I think as, as a, you know, as a more mature person, you can watch these and, and get it much more easily. But, um, uh, He's, he always is tackling sort of very interesting and unique subject matter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's let's go ahead and start. And I think as we move through, we'll touch on different aspects of his style and, and how it's displayed in the different movies. Um, so Bottle Rocket is a lot of like a lot of people consider Bottle Rocket one of his best films. It's kind of got like a cult status. I, I I like it a lot. I don't love it as much as I like the other ones. Um, it, it you can tell it's his first movie. Um, it, it was based off of a short film that he made, and I think the basic concept with the short film was the hilarity of a scene where two people enter a house and are like casually talking about random weird things and in Wes Anderson esque dialogue, and it turns out they were just robbing one of their mothers as like a, a practice robbery, and like that's what the the short spins out on and that's what the the film as a whole spins out on um but there there's definitely like signs of his style in in the dialogue um because nobody talks like people talk in a Wes Anderson movie um even like even when it's showing lower class type individuals everyone talks with kind of like a a regal tone um they're all very articulate um and if they're it's hilarious but it's not hilarious in like a laugh out loud kind of way. It's more like a chuckle at the dialogue that's said. Um, yeah. And, and this, this movie definitely has that. Um, it, it is like it, you can tell, and I don't know if it was monetary constraints because this was very cheaply made, but um, the, the, the typical Wes Anderson camera movements aren't really there. Um, Wes Anderson likes to m- move the camera in two dimensions a lot, not really in three he sets it up and then kind of moves it side to side or up and down. Um, he doesn't push into the scene very much and move around the scene. He still does it in every one of his movies, but this movie didn't have as much of that. There are some scenes where it had it. Um, so it, it, it's, it feels like a first film, but it is it's still really good. And I think part of that is his dialogue. Part of that's the actors that he gets for these things. Um, the, the Wilson brothers are the main characters in this movie um, and are both really great considering they really had no acting training up until this point. Yeah, was this sort of a breakout role for them, or was this even before their breakout role? Um, I think it was probably even before. Um, I think this, this landed them both roles eventually, but I don't think either of them really had done anything up until this point. I think the the production of this movie, like, the people that are in it was just the people that happened to be living with, um, with Wes Anderson and Owen Wilson. Um, who who co-wrote this movie, by the way. Owen Wilson did write as well on this one and a couple of the other ones. Um, but yeah, most of the people in this movie are just their friends or like um, Deepak, which is a guy who appears in like the first four of his movies was just a guy at a coffee shop that they liked that they visited in Austin. <laughs> so like, <laughs> um, yeah, this was a very different kind of, of uh, much cheaper film style, but um yeah, I think I think you're right. It was their kind of breakout role, and this was the breakout movie. This was, um, it, it it kind of it flopped, I will say, but um, it was it like achieved cult status after that, and did enough for him to get Rushmore produced, which is really when when Wes Anderson blew up. Yeah, and it's interesting because it seems like um, he's sort of able to drive his his career forward by getting really big name stars interested by having really good scripts and doing really good work to, to the, you know, to the point of his last movie just being like, or his last couple movies, at least being extremely star studded. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it all started with, with, yeah, with these guys that 
no one have really heard of. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't like there's not much to talk about Bottle Rocket. I mean, I think it it, it touches on a lot of the, the themes that we're going to see in these later movies. Um, it's it's all about a, this friendship between these two characters and one's kind of self-destructive. It, it, the characters are very similar to, in, to other Wes Anderson movies in that they're um, they, they don't none of the characters in Wes Anderson films seem to work a lot. <laughs> these characters <laughs> are are along that same line. Uh-huh. Um, it, but it, I mean, it's still like, it, it's still so, so much fun to watch and it's kind of ridiculous and and irreverent. And it's um, like, it's not, it doesn't really have a narrative. Like um, it, it, just, it just, it's not really a hangout movie either. Like these three guys pull off a, a robbery and go into hiding and then crazy stuff happens. And then they end up trying to rob a meat uh, packing plant and things go wrong. And, it's just silly and, and ridiculous and not really like anything else that had been made at the time. Um, okay. But I think it, it definitely established his kind of weird tone. And I think that was the most important thing because that got him onto his next movie, which is actually one of my favorites, I think, um, which is Rushmore. Okay. So yeah. let's talk about Rushmore. You said right. this was the first one that you saw. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I saw it in high school and you know, it, it's, it's funny because I had no, no real context for it. And honestly, for the first time I saw it, I probably just thought it was a very unfunny comedy um, because it's the Wes Anderson humor style where you're, you're not really busting up and, you know, laughing loudly. You're, you're more just sort of like extremely amused in it, it but, but very consistently extremely amused. Um, and of course now I love it because <laughs> I think I get it. I think I get it more. And it's funny over time, I actually laugh out loud more at Wes Anderson movies. Cause I don't know. I'm just, I'm appreciating them on more levels. Maybe. I don't know. Um, yeah. So I think it's just, his humor doesn't draw attention to it. So like your first time through, like, like five seconds after the joke, you're like, wait, that was ridiculous. But when you've seen it multiple times and you know, it's coming, then you react to it yeah. more viscerally. There's also a tendency for him to, he he, he it, it's sort of the magic of the tone that he manages to, to hold, where there there will actually alternate like a the movie will alternate between very serious bad things and sardonic humor, um, so rapidly that if you weren't sort of attuned to the to what he was going for, you would find it really off-putting that he was trying to go for humor so quickly after something bad happened absolutely Um, yeah and it's almost like he's trying to put you in this place where the bad things that happen are like viewed with the same lens as the humor such that everything becomes everything becomes sardonically humorous in a sort of like um um um, uh, the the author is is escaping me. Um, let's let's just move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I I think that's true because this one especially like th- this is a, Rushmore's a film about uh, a kid who only has one parent and he was he wrote a popular play when he was a kid so he's in the school with all these rich kids and he's like constantly feeling a need to prove himself, um, but. It, it's a pretty dark story because the the teacher that he connects with is a woman that's just lost her husband and he makes a lot of uh, of offhand jokes about um the fact that her husband is dead um which come off as cruel and it, that works for the 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 character because um the character is kind of an asshole but um the, yeah like the Max Fisher Fisher character is is a jerk but he's a jerk that you kind of learn like he's endearing in the end. Um, and yeah. I think it, that this to me starts his trend on um, exploring like father son relationships um, and, and parent child relationships or, or not even child. A lot, a lot of times it's adult relationships between a, a father and a son and they're both adults. Um, but um, he he has a, a difficult relationship with his father because he's um, kind of embarrassed by him. He latches on to the Bill Murray character because he's the kind of person that 
he he thinks he wishes his father was um but then like comes to a realization about the the people he's around and and um the bill murray's character is just as much of a selfish jerk as as he is kind of yeah i I want to i want to riff on something you said um which is basically that all of his um all of his movies have a character who is a jerk who can't help themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so like he, even the Bill Murray character also in this movie, like him, him and the Max Fisher character are, they're both, um, they're both very, uh, disagreeable people. And in fact, they have a lot of conflict with each other, but it's, it's like, it's from a place of pain and they can't help it. And it's sort of not their fault that they are that way. Um, and, eventually they're sort of able to heal each other. I think that is kind of a running theme through his movies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, what do you feel about, this is the first movie that I saw Jason Schwartzman in, and I don't know if this is his first movie or not. What did you think of his performance? Um, I don't remember having any problems with it. I haven't seen this movie recently. Um, I guess what, what comes to mind is just that he seemed really young and I don't know, on some level, maybe I gave him a pass for being young. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I think Jason Schwartzman is the best actor in the world, even as a as an old person. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, what, I, did you did you have a strong opinion about this? I mean, I think his best work is in a Wes Anderson type role. I mean, I think he, he reads and performs the Anderson dialogue very well um, because a lot of it comes from a place of kind of like a lot of the lines are said, especially Bill Murray's, but Schwartzman has some in this that are just kind of completely apathetic in how the line is delivered. Um, and I think he does really good reads of that. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't have a, like, I think he's good, but I think that he's been in a lot of other stuff that he's not as good, but I think he does well with, with Wes Anderson. Yeah. It makes me wonder. Um, it makes me wonder how much, it, it it feels like I'm, this is complete conjecture, but it feels like Wes Anderson is like writing the scripts, and then before the scenes, he he's like sitting down with the actors and saying, "Okay, this is where your character's head is at. This is what has just happened to them. This is what is going to happen. This is why they're doing this." Because like very often, you'll get such you'll get nuance in ways that are very surprising. Um, I mean, it's not like like he he does work with a lot of good actors, so it could just be that these are great actors and they just they're drawing these things out of the scripts. Mm-hmm. But I feel like it's so consistent across all the movies and even within the movies that he's that I, I feel like he, the director him you know the writer director himself is is guiding this process too. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that's probably a pretty safe assumption. Um, so what I'm trying the, the thing about this movie and I like it so much, but I try to come up with like a, an overall theme of what this movie was trying to say. And that's, that's where I struggle with this one as much as I love it. Um, I mean, I, Max Fisher kind of learns stuff. I mean, he, 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 I guess he kind of grows up and it's this very, like a, a lot of Wes Anderson movies and we'll get to Moonrise Kingdom, but I think that one encapsulates it more than anything. Um, have kids being told to grow up by adults that are just as childish and ridiculous as them. Um, and that, that the kid and adult relationship helps both to act like an actual adults. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that's what happens here between him and and Bill Murray, um, who's obviously experiencing like some kind of midlife crisis by, acting like a child and being brought down to Max's level with the, the pranks that they pull on each other when they start fighting. Yeah. No, that, that is really interesting that uh, yet another theme across his works is, is the sort of treating kids and, and the, the inner life of the kids with a lot of respect and consideration. Um, Cause a lot of the movies either like are about kids or have kids or are about adults, but flashback on what the adults are doing as kids. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, th- their kid existence is treated as being just as valid a part of their existence as their adult existence, 
which is actually quite refreshing, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. So anything else more you wanted to, to speak about Rushmore? Um, I could talk about this movie for the rest of the time, but we got so many other ones. No, I, I don't think so. I, I probably have the least clear memory of, much, of Rushmore anyway. So yeah. yeah, let's move along. So let's the next one, and I'm just doing these in order they came out because that's the best way to track the progress of a filmmaker. Um, but the next one's the Royal Tenenbaums, and I think this is this. I love this movie so much. This is a great movie, and I, but I think this is like Wes Anderson made big enough name for himself with Rushmore that he finally started getting more control over his films. Because while I think both Bottle Rocket and Rushmore were tonally Wes Anderson movies. I think this one was the first that really seemed stylistically his type of movie in that um, the the way he has characters dress, um, the way that rooms are decorated, um, and, and just the, the interesting style that I've never really seen before. Um, I think just because he had the, the budget finally to do it, and like I was talking about at the beginning, like the, the house that the Tenenbaums live in in this uh, movie was like a fully created house like a fully functional it wasn't a set it was a house in new york city um that they came in and, and dec- redecorated themselves and um hand painted wall art by his brother like um like they put in new carpet and wallpaper and made it look like a wes anderson style um so this is i think wes has found his his voice in all aspects of his filmmaking uh, yeah and and this one also explodes into a lot more characters, um, which it, which he continues to do. I think where you know, I think in Rushmore I, again. I didn't see Bottle Rocket, but in Rushmore, there's the, it's fairly tight on on a small number of characters. Yeah, Royal Ten Bombs is is branching out with all these different characters, and there's sort of like every every one of these characters in this family, and even characters outside of this family have their own relationships with each other and get their own little moments. Um, like, you know, the, the, the guy who's the guy who ends up marrying, uh, Tenenbaum's wife has this moment with, uh, Tenenbaum's son, Chaz, where they just kind of commiserate over the fact that they're both widow widowers. And it's, it's, that's just kind of a microscopic moment in this whole tapestry where you have all of these different characters who are, who are swirling around each other in this very realistic way where it doesn't even feel like a, a narrative. Sometimes it just feels like a bunch of stuff that happened, but in a yeah. good way. Um, Absolutely. I, I, I love this movie also. This maybe one, I don't know. It's one, definitely one of my favorites of his. It's hard to rank them though. Cause they appeal to me in different ways. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you to at the end. So, okay. just be- <laughs> uh, well. no, so yeah, I, I completely agree. Like the ensemble cast in this movie is great and the the writing of them is so good and each of the characters is so unique and, but it still ties into the, the overall central narrative. The, the thing that I like the most about this movie, like this is a really tragic story. I mean, these are the child prod- prodigies basically um, that the parents got divorced, the father left their lives and everything kind of tanked after that. Um, like, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's character was a brilliant playwright. She hasn't done anything. Uh, at the beginning of the movie, she hasn't written a play in seven years. Um, Chaz's, uh, Ben Stiller's character, um, is is, is a, a, a widower and, like, is basically so afraid of life that he's, like, protecting his kids. Um, uh, Luke Wilson's character is suicidal and... Um, like just wandering the globe lost everyone's kind of lost in this movie even even luke wilson's or, or uh, um the the other wilson yeah yeah luke wilson yeah right, right? <laughs> now uh, i'm confused owen wilson owen, owen wilson. wilson there we go yes, yes. There's so many wilsons um yeah even owen wilson's character is like the the looking at this family from the outside and always wanted to be part of the family and he's screwed up so everyone's screwed up like there's a there's a, a ser- four serious suicide attempt in this there's lying about deaths there's the death of a wife in a, a plane crash there's i mean like the dog yeah yeah <laughs> but like it, it's so amazing that like with all this like dour it's not a dark film it's like it's a funny like powerful film but it, it doesn't it's not dour like it's not de- pressing i mean it, it it's emotional for sure 
but um, it's still so enjoyable to watch. Um, yeah. and, and that's that's just I think that's what he does better than anything. Yeah, um, I, I, I really want to, like, understand the secret of how he does these these tone tricks, because, like, I, I don't know, I just the the part the part that's on my mind right now that I just have to, like, relate to to, to get off my mind is, is how like there's there's the scene where they basically I don't even remember what exactly precipitates this, even though I just saw this movie, but like they're going to kick they're going to kick Royal out of the house because uh some basically because they discover that he's a terrible liar in, in yet another specific way and 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 this is all played off as being funny of like for the viewer anyway it's supposed to be funny of of like how ridiculous royal is being and how just like fed up with it everyone else is and royal is being his normal self of just like kind of bl- blithely blithely i don't know how to say that word <laughs> Just kind of like, kind of like letting it all roll off his shoulders, like, yeah, well, you got me. And then he says something like, "I just want to let you know that this is that, that these last few days have been the best of my life." And and then the narrator cuts in, and the narrator hasn't said anything for like an hour or yeah. something. And the narrator says, "As soon as he said these words, he realized they were true." And then like, that's like the sudden gut punch out of nowhere, where where like you realize that this character. The the the, the 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 blitheness, whatever the word is, is is completely covering for something else, and he actually wishes he could be part of this family, but he can't help himself. And it's so many like uh, I don't know how you I don't know how you manage that without it just falling flat. But he t- always manages it. Yeah, without making it just like such a depressing chore of a film that. Like you don't want to watch it again, but right. like it, it, I, I actually wrote that part down when I was watching because I loved that moment as well. But the cool thing is all the other thing that's happening in that is like they're playing it off as a joke, but at the same time, like Chaz has serious father issues that this is just confirming the way he's already he's always felt. Um, Richie Luke Wilson's character is like really screwed up. Like he has a much better image of his father because to his father he was his favorite and. Um, which is another thing that Royal Tenenbaum does is that he treats his, he always treated his kids like they were adults. So he didn't mind just declaring one, his favorite and acting like, well, you're the most interesting one. So I want to hang out with you and the other two of you, I don't really care about. Um, but like he, he's dealing with it. Margot's dealing with her immense, like uh, uncomfortableness with, yeah. um, the fact that she's adopted and, that her father always made sure everyone knew that, and she never has really felt part of the family. Um, like so much is going on, and at the same time, there's there's a joke behind it. Um, I know someone I follow on Twitter, and I can't remember their name, and I'm I'm sorry I can't, but this is like their favorite movie of all time, just because they were adopted, and like this is just like the the family dynamic here as them from an adopted person, like they ball every time they watch this movie and it's like means so much to them. And I think that's, that's incredible. That's kind of why I love movies because people can have that reaction to a film like this. Yeah. That's this well-made. Yeah. Just, I just love it. Um, yeah. Like you said, it's, it's, um, it's, it's very difficult to like summarize the movie or, or explain why it's good or, 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 you know, you you could relate to someone the plot, and they and and be and it's kind of hard to understand why this is funny. Um, and yet, I I love watching it, and I could rewatch it, you know, two days in a row. Um, it's it's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could not explain the plot. I mean, the plot is, I guess, high level is Royal gets kicked out of his apartment, so he tries to move back home, so he has somewhere to stay, and then while he's doing that, his family kind of. A family that had separated and all gone out, gone to the wind, have all come back and congregated, and how they're dealing with that and their messed up lives. Um, but then, yeah. like it's like there's no driving force, there's no real conflict. It's just stuff happens, drama happens, and then people reach some sense of catharsis at the end. Yeah, and that's that's really it. Um, so let's move on to a film that has a little bit more of a narrative drive. Um, and maybe suffers for it. Um, the next one is is The Life Aquatic with Steve Zizou. Um, as I mentioned at the top, this is the first Wes Anderson movie I saw. Um, I loved it. I called it my favorite Wes Anderson movie for a long time. Um, 
Mathis might be my least favorite now. Interesting. Um, and, and say, I say that with like, I still love this movie. Like, it's like my least favorite of a collection of some of my favorite things ever. So and I'm not dogging on the movie at all. Um, I just, it's, it was my least enjoyable rewatch experience. Um, so what, what do you think about this film? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm trying not to let what you just said bias me, but it, <laughs> it, 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 it does have like, um, this, the most sil- silliness, silliness, um, in the sense that like it's got all these obviously you know intentionally fake looking underwater sets um it's got more i don't know like uh what's uh willem defoe's character just sort of strikes me as being ridiculous yeah in in more ridiculous than an, than an, <laughs> than a standard wes anderson ridiculous character um <laughs> like like over the top maybe is is the way to put it and (laughs) and yeah i mean there's a few i definitely like this movie um it's got a few great moments um because they all they all do um and it's got it's got the you know the ensemble cast and all the great interesting intertwining things going with all the characters um yeah i i think like the issue with me is I think more than any other, maybe it's just because this movie sets up like an actual end end point of the plot. And then it does its typical Wes Anderson kind of meander thing where like things like the movie just kind of goes along at his own pace. And, but because there's an actual end goal, I think maybe you feel that more than in any of his other films. Um, and and that's what hurt it for me a little bit. I don't know. Um, you're you're right. There's absolutely some moments that like the the end moment where he sees the the jaguar shark still like gets me. Like I think yeah. that's that's a beautiful moment. Um, and I don't mind the cartooniness of the fish. I think that's an interesting yeah. aesthetic choice. Um, I like that this is the first movie where you see his kind of dollhouse art style, where you kind of see the the ship like there's it, the side sliced out, and you're moving between. Um, rooms as the camera just moves vertically um and horizontally instead of yeah. actually moving around in 3d space this is the first movie that he really started doing that and i again i just think it's because he had the money and he could build a giant boat set that um had the side cut off or actually <laughs> i don't even know how he did that shot he might right. it might have just been camera tricks i don't know yeah um, that's interesting i don't either but i do i think that the relationship between bill murray and owen wilson uh, character here between Steve and his son or not really son. Um, I really enjoyed all that stuff. And I think I, whenever it moved away from that stuff to show other parts of the story is when I thought it hurt it a little bit. Um, because that's the core of the story is his son trying to reconnect with him. Um, and, and the slow realization that Steve has known about his son the entire time and just didn't care. Um, and then it turns out he wasn't his son anyway, but um, kind of became his adopted son just through their experience. I thought is is was, was really interesting. I like it makes you wonder what Wes Anderson's relationship with his father is. Um, yeah, because I mean, th- his parents got divorced, and I know he said that that was the biggest impact on he and his uh, siblings' lives was the divorce of their parents. So I mean I think Royal Tenenbaums and and I don't I don't know if he's quoted saying this it feels like his most personal movie um because like it, it, the the family has three children and his family had three children the the mom was an archaeologist and that's what his mom did um his parents got divorced and his father exited his life so but this this feels like a direct discussion on the, the father son relationship and and how important it is um yeah yeah, I I agree. Um Yeah, this this movie I actually the, the more you're talking about it the more I'm realizing that I actually really do love it. Um It's It's just got so many like this is this is the only one that I can think of off the top of my head that has like an action scene. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and and that's what makes it feel weird to me. And also the fact that like, it always makes me, I don't know, maybe this is a, this is a lack of maturity on my part, but it actually just kind of makes me mad that they kill um, Owen Wilson. 
toward yeah. the end. Like, I, I, cause I, the first time I saw it and pretty much every subsequent time, I'm, I'm just like, no, why? Like, that's just mean. And I, I, I people who have religiously listened to all of our podcasts will probably recognize me saying that because it just really annoys me when I feel like, when, and maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like there's no reason to do that other than to like hurt my feelings as the viewer in a, in, in kind of a, a manipulative way. Um, and I, I think of Wes Anderson as being better than that. Like he's uh, better than just sort of like, ah, I can make you love this character. And then I killed him. Aha, I got you. Um, and, and, and I'm probably not being fair because I think that there is a lot more going on than that. Like it's really about Steve Zissou and his, his struggle with himself and all that. I just don't see why they had to kill that character. And I don't understand. Maybe you can explain to me why that's the correct narrative choice. See, I, I agree with you, though. I don't think it is. I think, you know, at the beginning of the movie, he loses um, his best friend, and then he kind of goes searching for someone to replace him and finds this kid who's calling himself his son, so he latches onto him as as a replacement for his best friend. And then he loses that guy, too. Um, and, and I, like, I don't, I don't think that was a necessary part of the story. I think, actually, the, his... his tonal juggling he does i think almost hurt that too because the scene up until like you realize that like he's actually the net is actually going to die it the scene is played off very humorously i mean they're just flying in this ridiculous looking helicopter that just suddenly breaks and then they crash and it's like oh wait he's he's really dead like what what right um yeah right. so i mean i so i can't i can't explain it to you because I, I don't, I don't like it either. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's hard to imagine that like catharsis has been achieved because at the end he sees the Jaguar shark and like everyone's, everyone's putting their hand on him to be supportive. And, and it, it, you do, you definitely feel like an upswelling of emotion, but the upswelling is not like, Oh, everything's going to be okay now. It's more like, this is so sad Right, like it's, he, he's, it's, he's lost so much. It's the end of his life, really. I mean, that's <laughs> that's him letting go of everything because he's done as a filmmaker. Like, I think the the very end of the movie is him sitting on the steps while his movie's being showed, and you can just kind of tell he's so done with it. Yeah, um, he's just done with it all, and so yeah, it's like it, there's it's not a happy ending at all. Um, yeah, I, I, and I just don't know. Like, I guess maybe that had to be like. He had he had to lose the guy he latches onto again for him to truly realize that hey like like you like this is that's not the correct type of relationship or or what have you I, I don't know yeah or maybe it, maybe the lesson is that he's been he's been t too focused on his his identity as Steve Zissou the the great the great uh, oceanographer and and a filmmaker and it's it's actually cost him his humanity in some way that's, that's the thing is is other was i love this movie i do but other Wes anderson movies i feel much more confident you know analyzing what they're about and what the point is this one i'm left fumbling yeah yeah and maybe that's why i don't like it i mean well that's i like it the least i still really like it i mean but yeah i don't know yeah right so let's move on to the one that I used to call my least favorite until I rewatched it. Um, so Darjeeling Limited is a movie I had only seen once in the theater. Um, that came out while we were in college, I think. And so that was the first one I got to see in theaters. And I remember not liking that movie. And I couldn't remember why. Um, but I remember not liking it. And I watched it again the other day. And I love this movie. Um, everything that we were talking about with not being sure what the, the theme or the point of the film is with Life Aquatic, like I think this is the most thematically focused and clear of his films. Um, I mean, this, this is a movie essentially about three brothers whose father died, who refuse to let go of the past and can't move on, literally, um, figuratively and literally letting go of their baggage. The movie right. ends with them throwing their father's bags away that they've been lugging around with them the entire time. Right. And it's just, it's so good. I love this movie. This, I, I really, I'm going back and forth, but I might call this one my favorite at the end of the day. Um, 
I yeah. I enjoyed the hell out of this movie. Yeah. Um this this movie the first time I saw it in theater probably had the opposite reaction. I don't know, I can't name any other movie that's affected me so much watching it in, in the theater. Um I, I would actually like after watching it, I was I was kind of like telling people about it and using using the language of this film emotionally destroyed me, um, <laughs> which is funny because I don't think I actually like cried in the theater. Like I don't I guess I don't normally cry in the theater, but um, it was more it was a deeper level of like, you know, something shaking something at the core and. I've almost flinched away from analyzing why that is exactly because it's such whatever nerve it's hitting, it's a very raw nerve. Um, but it's whatever it's accomplishing, it's very effective at it. And, and this is actually a movie that I will not watch that I will not rewatch whenever. And it's not because I don't like it. It's because I think it affects me too much. It's too honest. And, um, it doesn't actually have that layer of irony or, or whatever you want to call it, that Wes Anderson sort of sardonic humor um, and that which, which sort of insulates you in, in his other movies. Yeah. There's no insulation here. And I find it, I find it painful, um, but that doesn't mean I don't love it. Yeah. I, so this, like the thing that I love the most about this movie is it, you have these three brothers that are set off to have this spiritual journey and they've set it in India because that's exactly what three white guys would think. Oh, I want to have a spiritual journey. I need to go to India to do it. Right. And it's like, it. it's very, they want to have like some sort of awakening or some sort of deep realization, but they're not actually having any of those deep realizations and it's characters acting like they've come to some realization when they actually haven't. And that's super fascinating to me. And I mean, it's not until the very end of the movie that they actually do have their real realization. Um, but I, I, I love, I love the, the baggage being a, a literal metaphor. I, I love um, like all the, the Adrian Brody's character carries around all his, the trinkets of his father. Um, yeah. And the other characters like, yell at him for it but secretly it's not because they think it's unhealthy for him it's just because they want the stuff too right um i love that like like each of them is going through their own thing and it's all kind of connected to the fact that they haven't really moved on to, from their father's death like adrian Bodie's character is about to be a dad and he has no emotions towards it um uh, owen wilson's character is suicidal which is something that's really like I love the fact that that's so casually revealed at the end of the movie. Like he just, he, the whole movie, he said he had this terrible motorcycle accident. And then at the end of the movie, he just reveals to his mom that uh, he crashed it on purpose. And it's like, the movie doesn't even stop for that to land a beat. It just moves on. So you're like, Oh, Holy crap. And it colors yeah. like everything you've seen him do up until that point. Right. Um, yeah. And it also it indicates that he didn't tell his brothers this because at that point, or you know, up to that point, he knew they wouldn't really care. Yeah. Um. Or or they would care, but they would um they would act sarcastic and, and snotty about it. Um. But o over the course of the movie, they get to a point where they they have like sort of found you know. I I think the issue is that they they all they're all devastated by the loss of their father and they all mutually remind each other of their father. And so they sort of hate each other because they remind each other of their father. Right. And then as they come to terms with their father's death, they're able to find comfort in, in, you know, grieving together. And so by the end of the movie, he is able to sort of share his, his injuries with his brothers and, and that's, and it's healing rather than, you know, snotty, which is what it's been up to that point. Yeah, and my absolute favorite moment of the film is at the end. Um, th they they go to their mother and they basically decide to go like confront their mother about why she basically abandoned them. And there's this wonderful scene where they're they're arguing with her, and she says, "Let's just deal with this like unspokenly." And and all these characters who really haven't stopped talking the entire run of the film finally stop talking and the film cuts to this 
the, the the typical Wes Anderson dollhouse thing where um it's the the front half shaved off and we're moving through it except this time it's a train only it's not really a train it's the first few ones are train cars and then it's like all the different characters we've seen the one uh, Jason Schwartzman's ex girlfriend um Adrian Brody's wife um the businessman that they randomly saw at the beginning of the movie and it just it just goes through train cars like that um but basically the whole thing is like we're all on this the, the, the life is this big long train and we're all moving in the same direction and we're all together in this and i just i loved that moment so much i thought it was great yeah yeah the, this movie is a, a master class on metaphors i think cuz yeah. like you said everything from the train to the baggage to the fact that Adrian Brody wears his father's glasses, which which are prescription glasses, <laughs> yeah. and so he's blind walking around. Um, I mean, you'd probably find some metaphor in the fact that like one of his shoes is stolen. It, it's um, it, it's it's all it's all a metaphor for like they're grieving and. Well, yeah, and the shoe is. I mean, like he's he's wearing the shoe and the belt, and he, he's paid a crap ton of money to model these after the luggage. Like the belt is not part of his father's luggage but it has the same images on it it has the same kind of um uh, his name structure on it so like like owen wilson's character is just as obsessed with their father and like like can't let go and that he's i think they said the belt was like three thousand dollars for a custom belt to do this stuff and <laughs> it's just like it's it, it's so perfect it just everything lines up perfectly i love like all the little set pieces too, like the laminated itinerary, like you don't, <laughs> you you don't go on a spiritual journey and bring a laminated itinerary and have a, a guy whose job it is to organize your spiritual journey. I mean, like every, every way they do it is just so perfectly wrong and, and contrasts with everything they see until they have the actual one real moment, which is when they try to save um, the, the, the drowning kids yeah. And Adrian's Brody, Adrian Brody's character can't, and that's just like it, it all just tie, like it all ties together so perfectly. Yeah, and it's it's not like it, it's 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 one of those metaphors that like works and is functional, but isn't like hard to pick out, you know? Like, yeah, and right. I, it's not distracting either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's just like I I I can't believe I didn't like. Th- I don't remember why I didn't like this movie, but I I was shocked. I I expected going into this one not liking it and I was just riveted to the TV and Yeah. Sometimes with these movies, sometimes with Wes Anderson, I think you really benefit on the second watch from knowing where things are going because it is such an unusual narrative like pacing and and so forth that um you're just lost very often the first time you watch it. And, and yeah. you don't and also like especially when he's doing these complicated tricks involving tone like 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 we just we just kind of agreed with life aquatic we we didn't like how it kind of took this turn from being farcical to suddenly being deadly serious and um and in in, in this movie i think actually it works incredibly well but it but maybe 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 it takes a couple of watches to get it because you know you've got it, it's I, I believe what happens i haven't seen this one in a while but i this movie sort of burned into my mind like the, the brothers are watching these kids try to cross the river and adrian brody says like and it's obviously supposed to be funny he's like look at these assholes um about yeah. about these little kids and then like i don't know something the rope breaks or something yeah. and like within 15 seconds one of the kids is dead and and you're not you it, it's it's not it's it's tone whiplash but it's not it, it's it's not bad tone whiplash in fact i shouldn't even use that term because i usually use that term when the tone is just jumping around haphazardly this is this is highly intentional yeah yeah um, i love this movie so much yeah it's incredible all right unfortunately i think it's time to move on from this yes. movie um which isn't bad because we have 3 to go and they're all really good movies too um I, I don't fantastic Mr. Fox is I don't think we can talk too long on this one one because you haven't seen the film and two because this is uh, just a a creation of a a, a Roald Dahl kids book in stop motion animation form and it's technologically amazing like 
the way they made this like stop motion animation fascinates me because it seems like such a pain in the ass and i just i just like don't know why you would ever want to do it <laughs> but it, it looks so beautiful and, and amazing um, yeah and the, the coolest part i can say about this movie is like all the animals were like had were covered in fur so mm-hmm. like when they would be moving them to take pictures the, the fur would move around a little like in uncontrollable ways like they just couldn't stop it um and it actually when it played back made it look more natural because the fur looked like it was moving um and i thought that was really cool but i mean this this movie still dives into the same Wes Anderson themes. I mean, you have a father son relationship where the the father is not really realizing his full potential, and he's he's taking it out on his son who um, isn't realizing his full potential either. A new kid comes along, and he's distracted by that kid's potential and power, and um, and he he's just kind of lost in his life, and and everyone kind of is. It has all those same themes, but it's not like it's not nearly as deep of a movie as like Darjeeling is or T- Tenenbaums is it's just it's just really good um it's just really enjoyable um it's a fun romp i think um and 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 Wes Anderson experimenting with stop motion which he really liked cuz i think he wants his next movie to be stop motion as well okay um, yeah I, I can imagine someone who obviously cares about control and having their vision be perfect would would like stop motion where you literally can control every, you know, everything on the screen. Yeah. Of course, that's, that's what it does to beg the question. Why not just go all the way to like animation? Yeah. But uh, I don't know. Maybe he'll do that someday. Maybe. The, the only thing, I guess, before we moved on, we haven't touched on the, the music, really, the scores in these films at all. Um, and they're really good. They're really yeah. good. Like Fantastic Mr. Fox, the score is great. But we skipped over... The amazing David Bowie covers in the Life Aquatic, um, which are just incredible. Like, like the cover. I think it's like a, a French guy. I'm not sure his name. I'm blanking on it right now. But doing these, these really good covers of the songs. But that's that. I think that goes back into Anderson's obsession with kind of control, and that he is deeply involved in the music, and it all always seems to work for me. Um, there's always kind of like a a montage scene with a song playing over it that works really well. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't understand music as much as I would like to, but it's, it's always, it's, it's always very seamless. Like you're never yeah distracted by, by the music choices that he's making. Although when you do pay attention, you're, you're always um, sort of amazed that, something so perfect could have been chosen for what he's showing. I right, guess. right. Like where does, where do you find these? Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. Moonrise kingdom. Um, what do you think of this movie? I, I really love this one too. Um, we're, we're starting to sound like broken records. Yeah, I know <laughs> the, I, the, 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 this is, this is the problem is like, I really, I mean, I, I have no idea how to rank these. Um, I love that this movie like treats the the kid characters with with respect um and you know gives them their like it gives them autonomy and and inner lives because i don't know i i sometimes i think that i like remember my childhood better than most people or i I don't know what it is exactly but like it really appeals to me because i remember being a kid and sort of resenting how you know you're treated as like subhuman when you're a kid because you're a kid um but your your inner life is is just as as real even if maybe you're not fully like as intelligent as you're going to be when you're an adult um and you know aside from that it's it's this great story with lots of great actors this may be you know the the most ensemble of the stories uh, i don't know i don't actually know how the you know the cast numbers compare between movies um I don't know. That's I, at the risk of rambling. Uh, what, what do you think about this one? Yeah, I, I love it too. Um, for a while, I called this my favorite, <laughs> which is going to be uh, something you're going to hear again in a little bit. But um, uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I love that. Like, this is a story about a, a, a childhood romance, and the the two characters who have everything figured out the most are the two children and it's these are children rebelling against kind of 
a set set of way of life or way of living that their parents are living or that, that they've been told to exist in and every adult character in this movie is like a mess like they're they're having affairs or they're like this ridiculous straight laced um scout master played by ed norton like yeah. they're all they're all a mess but they're still dictating what is the correct and incorrect thing to do to these two children who seem like they've got it pretty well figured out on their own um i, I like that so much and i like that like um the the reaction by the other scout troop when they see the two of them together is like almost over violent with the weapons that they all bring and stuff um because they like they literally want to destroy this thing that they don't understand. And I, like, I, I love that, like, they, they try to destroy it, they don't succeed, but they end up joining forces with the two kids in the end because they, it's kind of like us where, like, on the surface, these two kids acting like adults is, is funny, but at some time there's something super endearing about it and you're rooting for the two of them um, as they set up their own little personal life on this the edge of this island. Um, right. And, and yeah, I mean, it's like, I just, I just love that. I love like the idea of setting up a, a childhood romance where you're both simultaneously making fun of it, but also clearly showing that the, the adult structured, st- structured way of life, like, isn't any better because they're all miserable. Yeah. Th- that's, that's the loveliness of the, of the Wes Anderson magic here in particular is that uh, there's a scene or a line of dialogue where the, the boy forget his name he's he's outlining his like plan of what they're going to do and it's like it's like uh, i will i will get a job as on like a a a coal ship or something ridiculous (laughs) like that and and whatever it is it just sound like when he he says it with like complete earnestness and you the viewer are just like that's adorable because that's the most impractical childish thing i've ever heard um but he's completely earnest about it and what's in, what's funny is that he's actually accomplished everything he set out to accomplish up to this point in the movie yeah so you're actually in a place where like within movie logic it within movie logic he might actually pull that off um which is delightful yeah it's, it's, yeah and and you're you're the, the movie does play a lot i think with um, the difference between reality and and fantasy, and what is allowed to happen inside the movie, kind of straddles both ends of that spectrum. Yeah, like because the Susie's character, the 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 girl, like she's really into fantasy novels, right? And it almost seems at time that the events of the movie are taking place like in one of her books, because um, there's yeah. like the the lightning strike and then the them dangling from the tower at the end like mm-hmm. it does it 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 goes to a level of almost unrealistic ridiculousness um but it works it works so well yeah yeah at no point are you are you broken out of the movie by the ridiculousness it's no. it, and and yet you're also able to take things seriously when they're supposed to be taken seriously i think that's right. yeah we are I, I am repeating myself at this point but that's how he always manages to do it is this impossibly fine line between between very serious and heart-wrenching things and like absolute uh farce basically yeah and well there and there's still like there's there's a sweet story underlining it another father-son relationship with with bruce willis's character eventually adopting the kid and like like it just it that's another theme that ties into it well that um, that it takes Sam and Susie's ridiculousness for Bruce Willis's character to realize the what he's doing wrong in his life, and to to so by adopting this kid, he's actually also helping himself and and setting his life on a better path. Um, it's just so good, and it's yeah. funny, and it's like it's what like this is movie like when I watched this movie, I was like, okay, here it is. He's like really into his two dimensional character camera movement now like he does it here more than anything like it's a very stationary cam and if it's not stationary it's not moving in 3d space it's moving left and right it's moving up and down um and he like we we haven't talked a lot he uses like camera for jokes too like 
he does so, like some whip pans and some right. like camera double takes to sell jokes and it's like creative and it's not just like it, st- when stuff is funny in these movies a lot of times it's because of the dialogue but it's also because how both the characters and the camera reacts to the funny dialogue um and that happens a lot in this movie yeah yeah it, even just like where he chooses to cut will, will right. make me laugh right. sometimes um yeah that's that's definitely something i i think i think it would pay to pick one of these movies and watch it multiple times you know in a row or or over the course of a few days anyway because when i'm watching them i'm usually so swept up in the feelings and the story that i'm not thinking about camera yeah, yeah. and music and things like that um which is funny i mean cuz cuz normally i have no trouble noticing things like that like I, I feel like most movies that I watch, I'm actually watching from a distance, um, a sort of a critical distance, not even on purpose, just because, just because I can't help it. Yeah, um, I'm but the his, same way. His movies, I'm usually sucked in fairly completely, and I don't have that distance, and it makes it harder to be to comment or to even think about camera angles and stuff yeah, like that for that, me. That's fair. Yeah. So let's are you, are you ready to move on to the final the final sure. film? Let's do it. So the Grand Budapest Hotel. Matt, when I saw this movie, I said that this was my favorite Wes Anderson <laughs> movie. Um and it was it was that until I think I, this rewatch. And now that's mm-hmm. all jumbled in the air and I I don't even know. I'm going to have to give you a definitive answer once we're done, but um this movie like this this movie is so sad. Like this is a tragic. This, but it's also so joyous. Like this is a movie that takes place during World War Two, basically. I mean, not directly. It's a different world with a different war, but it's ostensibly Europe and World War Two and the destruction of this this beautiful old way of life and um and and um the coming in of this terrible new wave of of awfulness that happened in the time. But it's also like the story of this incredibly eccentric, hilarious man and the impact he had on this young immigrant. And there, it's also their love story. It's also um, a tragedy. It's also about the act of writing and stories itself. To me, this is like a culmination of everything that he does. And it's a culmination of his styles. It's almost as if, like this is a response to his criticisms that said he was getting kind of too zany and too like weird. And he just like doubled down on everything. Uh Like all of his style, like is like turned up here and it just, it works so well. Like from the, the decoration inside the hotel itself to the entire chase scene in the snow and just how that is shot. Like, like nothing else in the movie. It's like shot hilarious and like almost like cartoony. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's like it's I I don't know I just love it I love it I like Ralph Fine is so good like yeah in this movie um also other movies have narrators but this may be the only one that I can think of that actually has a framing story yeah um yeah and it's cool like I I didn't notice this the first time I saw it I did notice it this time he he switches up aspect ratio three times in this movie. Okay. So in the movie opens with a girl in 1985 reading a book and the author of the book explaining uh, how he gets stories. And that's in one aspect ratio. And then it goes back to the 60s where it has um, the author as a young man being told the story by the zero character. And that's in uh, a widescreen aspect ratio that was popular back in the 60s. And then it goes back to the 30s. And it's in a, I think it's one three three or one three seven ratio. It's the which is called the Academy ratio, which came out the year that the um, the movie takes place. So it's like he's using these different aspect ratios of the time to like cement the style of the time frame. I thought that was really cool and interesting trick. Yeah. That I somehow completely missed. I don't know how I didn't miss because going from like a like the the sixties is like a two. Three five or something like a massive widescreen going from that to a one three seven like that's a huge change and I, I completely missed <laughs> I don't know how yeah 
I don't think I noticed it either. I mean, to clarify for the audience and also for myself, what this <laughs> refers to is is like th there's going to be black bars on the screen in various um, various different aspect ratios, right? Yeah. So basically, your your different parts of the screen are have black bars on them at different times, and you think you would notice that. Yeah, it's um, it's a measurement of the width of the frame by the height of the frame. Um, so widescreen is two, three, five. So that means it's almost over two times as wide as it is tall. Yeah. Um, et cetera. But yeah, I, I don't know how I didn't notice it. Um, for those listening, the next time you watch, you probably notice now, but it's, it's interesting stylistic technique and I think it works. Um, so what, what do you, I don't think I got your opinion cause I was talking forever. That's, um, <laughs> that's what funny. did you, what did you think of this, this film? Um, I'm trying not to just say that I, I loved it also. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so I don't, I, I don't think that I would put it at the top of my list. It's, it's definitely like Wes Anderson does seem to have become more powerful with each subsequent movie and better at, at getting across what he's trying to get, get across. Basically like from a filmmaking point of view, this is definitely the best i would say mm -hmm. from, a, from a story point of view i don't think it connects with me as well as some of his other stories yeah that's fair that's that's the only thing that makes it um that that would count against it uh, perhaps but even this it's not like it's not a an extremely good like impactful story it, it's more of like a it's a different style of a story it's like a sweeping sort of epic and there's you know the characters are traveling between different locations and being chased and like you said there's a yeah there's an action scene in this movie too so i was yeah. wrong there's a there's this there's this there's the action scene in the snow um at least one actually um and you got these crazy like european uh nobility or whatever they are who are just completely insane and pr probably a fairly accurate depiction of what that was like at the time yeah um yeah, it's just really, really fun and great tone and everything. I haven't seen this one in a while, unfortunately, so I'm, I'm not sure what else. You know, the the part that sticks with you is he, he does it again at the end, where he sort of takes you from a situation that is silly and then makes it very sad very suddenly. Yeah, like the line, like they shot him, of course, was like gut wrenching. Yeah, and like. I forget exactly what he says, but like, there it is nice to know there's some people of standard in this terrible world or something, and he was one of them. And then it's like, oh, they they shot him. Yeah. And then that his his wife dies too, and. <laughs> yeah. Right. You just, and that's one thing I, I can't claim credit for this, but like, um, I, I read something or saw something about how like there's all these clues about how everything is sort of going to hell in the background while this silly story about this painting or whatever is, is progressing in the foreground. Um, I, the, the one that comes, the one that comes to mind is when like somebody opens a newspaper and uh, the, like the headline is obviously something about like the country is being invaded or something extremely disastrous. Right. But, then, like, but then the camera focuses on like, the part of the the part of the page that is actually relevant to the story, right? Um, so so all this stuff is building up in the background, and it's about to blow Europe apart, and our story is is just is just a story in the middle of all this, right? Which is cool because it's like I like that it's saying that there were these other stories going. Like history is not just the big, all-consuming event. Like there were other smaller. And and some would argue equally important stories going on, um, at the same time. And yeah, I like that he can tell, like the Wes Anderson take on a World War II story is. No, I'm not going to talk about the war. I'm going to talk about this character who represented something that the war eventually destroys. Um, yeah, and I'm going to tell a, a fun story about him. And I just yeah. love that. Like, it's it's so great. Yeah, that reminds me how you know. You can tell, I mean, this is especially effective for, for kids, which is why I think they target this at kids. But, like, you can tell people about the Holocaust. And most most people, and especially kids, are, are not going to really process it because it's very abstract. But you make them read something like the, Diar the Diary of Anne Frank, and 
one one story about one person somehow manages to make the thing real and in the same way i think you know this is you you're so sad about about the main character of this movie and his plight that it makes the whole sadness of the whole event real for you yeah absolutely because the whole movie is about him struggling and eventually succeeding and then in the end it was kind of all for nothing so like yeah that the event and its effect is much more uh relatable and and understandable when you have a character that you know and yeah. and, and see how that affects that person it's the old like uh, one death is a tra- tragedy and a thousand deaths is a statistic thing when it, when yeah. you bring it down to the personal level um it's m- more digestible and understandable yeah and 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 it's not it's not just that they it's not just that they kill him but it's almost the fact that they just obviously disregard everything about it, it it's like they <laughs> it's like they kill the story almost it, it's like they've you've had this whole this whole sort of whimsical fun story and the lesson is like what happened was a tragedy not just because someone died but because like their whole way of life died yeah well especially in the way that it it happens because it's a mirror of the earlier scene when they get stopped and he talks one talks his way out of the problem and two uses his stature and respect in the world um as a way to to dissuade the people from taking this action and then in the end his stature which is even more improved because not only is he was he at the beginning he was just a respected um concierge yeah concierge yeah. of a hotel and now he's this rich and powerful person and there's no respect for it it's gone the the note that he was given his power was ripped up and thrown away and they don't care yeah yeah but then, it's a sad but, note. <laughs> yeah, but then the line at the end is like, like he asks, like Zero says that his way of life had had died a long time ago, and he was the only one trying to 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 keep it to keep an image of it going. And so that's like that compounds upon it is like <laughs> the, the tragedy that like it it, it might have died even even before this event, but. It truly died when the last person trying to keep up this way of life was was senselessly taken. Yeah, we ended that, this one on a downer. Yeah, that's uh, which is which is not not appropriate because Wes Anderson movies are usually very delightful. But well, and it still was like it's a sad movie, but it still it still is delightful. And I watched it today right before we recorded, and and I loved it still. Like I, I enjoyed watching it. It was funny. It was weird. It was. Like it was all the the perfect Wes Anderson things. Yeah, I guess that's the thing is the thing the thing that lodges in you and 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 stays in your mind for like in many cases days after watching is actually those gut punches that he sneaks in there. Um, even though at the time you were much more cognizant of the humor. Um, yeah, well, isn't that just like that? That to me is brilliant filmmaking because if you can sneak it an important message that sticks with you into an entertaining package, then you've succeeded as a filmmaker in my mind. Like it's an enjoyable film and it says something as well that stays with you after you watch it. Yeah. That's great. All right. So let's wrap this up by the the question that's been looming over our heads the entire time. I'm not going to make you order them because that's going to be ridiculous, but could you, could you say which is your favorite right now? Well, so I'll, I'll give like a a, a cop out double answer. Um, <laughs> I, I did just watch the, the Royal Ten Bombs, and so that's probably biasing me in favor of Royal Ten Bombs. So I'm going to say Royal Ten Bombs with that caveat, and then and then either Darjeeling Limited or Moonrise Kingdom would be my other candidates for favorite. So right. I'll narrow down the field for you. All right, that's I'll take it. It's kind of a cop out, but I'll take it. Yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna say Darjeeling Limited. Actually, um, I think out of all these, that affected me the most, and it, and it, 
I think it it helps that it was the most surprising too because that was out of all these movies that's the only one I I just hadn't watched since I saw it in theaters um so I just hadn't come back to it and it, it was just so much better than I thought it was going to be so it gave it a bump for me yeah so that's what I'm going to say surprising okay. I can't believe it well good I think I mean we we uh, I put it on my short list and you said it was your favorite so <laughs> I think I think that it gets the seal of approval from Bailey Planet Films yeah, so if you for some reason haven't seen the Darjeeling Limited yet, go see that movie. Yeah, I don't know. Forget if all the stuff that we said about it and go see. Yeah, it. we, we kind of spoiled the entire movie, but I mean, I don't know. Like, I think it's not that it's not really a plot thing. Yeah, it's like more of the, yeah, we talk a lot about how spoilers psychologically don't matter. Um, I think that's true in Wes Anderson movies more than anything. I think you can explain the movie all you want. It's still an experience on its own. Definitely. All right. So that's it for Wes Anderson. Matt, let's go through some some quick what have you been watching. This is going to be a long episode, but I'm okay with that because we had a lot of films to talk about. All these the deconstructing episodes are always pretty long. Yeah, that's that's fine. So Matt, what have you been watching? Um yeah, so so for first my my anti recommendation, uh I saw I watched A Walk Among the Tombstones which looked like it was going to be one of those Liam Neeson movies where he just shoots people the whole time and it's and it's and it's fun and you know a Liam Neeson shooting people movie I, I think is like a genre now um but what it actually was is it was more like 8 mm or like 7 where you just feel really sick <laughs> when you're when you're done and not even when you're done like from the first scene actually you just feel kind of ill and and like wonder why you're watching this and why they chose to subject you to these things. Um, so if you really liked eight millimeter and or seven, go check out a walk among the tombstones. Otherwise watch something else. <laughs> um, and then my other thing that I watched recently, which probably is also an anti-recommendation. I don't know. I, I watched The Force Awakens again. So this this is the second time I've seen it. I saw it once in the theater. And uh, I believe my quote on the, on the podcast at the time was that it was the worst movie of the year. Um, <laughs> and, and this time, my wife had not seen it at all. And we saw it on DVD. So we bought it, uh, basically, so she could watch it. And I liked it much less this time. So wow. not only was I not impressed in the theater, but I don't find that it held up too well. So yeah. there you go. I'm very curious because I bought this last week too and just have yet to see it because I had eight Wes Anderson movies to watch, so I didn't get, get around to it yet. Um, so I'm really anxious to see it again too. Um, I think, honestly, man, I think that's going to happen more and more as time goes on. As we get away from it, I think the overall consensus of the movie is going to shift yeah um, i think that's what we said we, yeah we, we did basically we, in we the podcast the future we, yeah we, we were like this is not going to hold up this is not going to be like the classics it's not going to be like the old ones where you can rewatch it anytime and and it's it's delightful it's i mean i i can attempt to explain it you know it, it kind of takes itself too seriously it it drags in places really badly um um it's it's it, it is a lot more violent like i i've shown my 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 fairly young kids most of the original movies there's only a few parts you have to skip over really like like the rancor and stuff like that where yeah. where you where a kid would be freaked out but like mo most of the violence in those movies is sort of the like sanitized like ninja turtles versus foot soldier violence where it's not it's not disturbing but this movie has a lot more of the like uh I don't know, brutally striking people down with lightsabers and cutting them across the face and 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 stabbing them through the chest and um uh blood. This I mean this one has real blood, you know. Anyway, that's Yeah. I mean and, and that's none of that's relevant. Like like if I have my normal person hat on, then that <laughs> then who cares? But if I have my like well, Star Wars movies should be palatable to children hat on then I see that as a negative. That's all. Yeah, yeah, that's understandable. Um, I think there's that push to make everything PG-13, even yeah. things that are ostensibly kids' movies. I mean, the the first 
five Star Wars movies were all PG, and then um, Return of the Sith or whatever, Revenge of yeah. the Sith, was the first PG-13, and that's what they're going to be from now on. Um, but Yeah, because that one was really great. Yeah, and... it was really just wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Cause didn't you always want to see your main character slaughter little children? Yeah, and then have three of his limbs cut off and fall into the fire. <laughs> All right, so uh, I I am going to watch Star Wars this week, and I will get back to you on on if my opinion has changed or not. Okay. Because um, I'm interested. I'm really interested, especially now to see that. Um, I watched a whole bunch of movies last week. On top of all these Wes Anderson movies I saw, I went to the theater a fair amount of times and saw some really good movies and some not so good movies. Um, since we're running a little late, I'll just talk about a couple. Um, one of them I'm going to talk about because I want you and anyone else to see this movie is The Invitation. Um, this is a Draft House Films movie. Um, I haven't written a review for it because to even write like 500 words is talking too much about the movie that I want people to go completely cold into. Um, it's a thriller that basically a, a man and his girlfriend get invited to a dinner party at his ex-wife's house. Um, and then weird stuff happens. And that's all I want to say. Um, it's, it's like a really intense thrill ride type movie. Um, that's just really good, really good. Um, it's available a video on demand, Matt. So, Oh, okay. So you can you can watch it at home. I think it's okay. ten bucks on Apple. Well, you can't imagine how tempting it is to just look this up right now and <laughs> read about it because of your sales pitch. But I will try to. So this, like, I you know me, I like watch trailers obsessively, and like every every piece of media that's released on movies, I've absorbed before I go see it. Um, this movie, I went completely cold. I okay. watched no trailers. I read no reviews. I literally just read the synopsis, which said basically what I just said to you, and it's worth it for this movie because this is a very like ratcheting up tension, not sure what to believe type of film, okay. and going in cold works the best. Yeah, it seems like this is the kind of movie where spoilers might matter more. It absolutely, absolutely, because um, un- not knowing is kind of the whole part of it. Um, that's key to to what the movie's trying to do. Okay. Um, so the other film I wanted to talk about was a movie I did not like very much, which was called Hardcore Henry. Matt, I don't know if you've heard of this one. This is the first person point of view action movie. I, I've seen trailers and been sort of in a state of disbelief that they would actually do such a thing. But yes, please tell me about this because I've been curious. So it's, it's a video game, except you can't play it. Um, it, it, it has like... I don't know if they set out to make a video game movie, but it has every single trope in video games you could think of. There's the bad guy with unexplainable powers. Um, there's the the really thin and terribly written storyline. There's awful dialogue. There's the terrible treatment of women. Um, this woman, this movie hates females, like <laughs> like it hates them like actively. I think, um, uh, and and I mean. So there's there's points when the action is like kind of incredible, like it's it's definitely a spectacle. But also, I don't think technology has really caught up to this the idea of this film yet, because like I play video games all the time, I watch things that move really fast, and by the end of this movie, I was nauseous. Yeah, and that gonna... that never happens to me. So like for that to happen to me, I can't imagine what it's gonna like. It it just because the movie's res- relentless and it doesn't stop. Like so like there's. If there's a 20 minute action scene, the camera's swinging around crazily for 20 minutes as your main character fights um, and, and jumps around and throws people around, and it's just like it's just, it's like sensory overload, and you just get sick. Um, yeah, and that, it's not that even sounds stupid. Yeah, and honestly. it's not even a good like it's not even a good story. It's like it's everything bad about a video game that's okay because. In a video game, you get to pick up the controller and then play, and it's interactive. But here, it's just it's like watching shitty cutscenes and then watching someone else play a game. And I, yeah. I don't, I don't understand. I, some people seem to really like it, and I don't, I don't understand. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I admit that I'm curious, but more of a morbid curiosity because yeah. I can't imagine. I mean, it's, it's like take everything that we take everything positive that we said about. Mad Max and how the camera work was done and do the opposite of that. And it sounds like that's what this is because 
first person. I mean, I don't know if people have heard about this. It's literally a first person movie, meaning the whole movie is is from the like visual perspective of the main character. Yeah. So when he when he turns around and whips his head around to punch somebody, the camera whips across the screen. Yep. Or you know, the 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 view the view does, and yeah, it's it's I haven't seen it, but it's just like wow, that's that sounds absolutely unbearable. Yeah, and so they used GoPros too. So they like built a rig where a GoPro was like put on a mask, a shoulder supported mask that the stuntmen wore um, to do this movie. So like. Not only are cameras not really great for this, but GoPros like cannot handle speeds like that a lot. So like you start moving that thing around fast, it gets blurry, it gets shaky, and it just it's not it's not enjoyable. I mean, there's part like there's some parts where it's really like one part he climbs a building, and like that's the closest I'm ever gonna feel what it's like to parkour up the side of a building. <laughs> um, but like there's other moments where it's just too much. It's just, it's just too much going on and there's not even a good narrative or or any kind of characters to propel you through it like the main character is a silent protagonist so he's not even like he he's supposed to be he's a you surrogate but also he has really no agency um just nothing there's nothing wow okay yeah as i when i first saw this i was like is this is this an oculus rift vehicle is this going to be a thing that's geared for for the new generation of VR devices and um because that almost makes sense but still not because when the vi- when the view is jerking around and your head is holding still I I still think that would be nauseating. Yeah. So I so. I I was worried that this was going to start a trend but this movie performed really bad this week. Um so I I I don't think it's going to start a whole new trend. I mean, I think we are going to see more movies like this. There was actually a movie that came out a few years ago called maniac um it was elijah wood horror movie where it's first person perspective from um a serial killer um that that worked a lot better because that stylistically made sense and also you're not having ridiculous jerky camera stuff um, because it, it allows you to like live in the mind of of a crazy serial killer but this this i uh, know no i don't want this i don't want more of this let's stop taking all the worst parts of video games and putting them in movies please right well i'm glad that our words will sway public opinion and (laughs) so many stop this so many (laughs) all right well that's all we had for this week um we went a little long but that is okay matt next week we're going to talk about game of thrones all right because finally because next week is the week before the season six premiere and this is huge we're going to have our resident game of thrones expert james gentry back on I mean, I'm sure he's going to be filled with lots of ideas about what this season's going to be and and the story so far and where it's going. Um, Matt, did you see the the new trailer that came out the other day? I well, I saw two. Yes, yes, I saw the new trailer. Correct. I'm excited. Um, yeah, yeah, me too. It's I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited, I'm probably more excited than usual because we got new new stuff that we don't we don't even know anything about. Yeah. So when we have this podcast next week, we're literally going to be speculating for the first time. Where if we did this last year, we would be pretending to speculate, but we would actually know what was happening. It's true. Uh, (laughs) It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Uh, All right. So check back next week for that. Matt, where can you be found on the internet? I am on Twitter at (laughs) M-O-R-I-D-I-N-A-M-A-E-L. And... um, that's mainly it yes <laughs> all right uh i am also on twitter at, at scott daily 85 that's d-a-l-y also uh at daily planet films and uh you can find all of our writing although not lately because i've been slacking at uh dailyplanetfilms.com and uh we will see you next week podcast is over it's done we hope you all had some fun go back to your work or your school Regardless, just go away. But please come back next Friday. There'll be a brand new podcast.